Welcome to the MMA Roadshow, episode number 341. My name is John Morgan. Cold Coffee is with me in Las Vegas. Cold Coffee, I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm just going to throw it out there. First week of October, it's about 78 degrees outside right now. I mean, summer is finally behind. This is the time to be in Las Vegas. April or October, and I don't care if you're tired of me saying it, this is my my message to the public. I'm telling you, if you're planning a trip to Las Vegas, do it right now. Beautiful day out there in Las Vegas. Oh, it is. It is so, so nice. In fact, my mom called me up the other day. She's like, I saw on the news that the weather is going to be nice and cool. And I said, Mom, this is why we live out here right now. This time of year. <laughs> You get you get through the heat, you get through the heat, and then you get the you get this sweet sweet weather where we have sun, and it's cool, and uh, you can still wear shorts out, and it's not too cold. Uh, I absolutely love this time of the year, and uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And we even we get a little more. Uh, uh, the other day we were getting more. I think it was like a rain front that came through, which really I think started the cold front, and came in a little cooler. So it's nice because we'll get the sun, but then you get a little bit of rain. So you get to, it, it almost feels like we're getting a little bit of seasons here. Where back in Ohio, we got all the seasons. But here in Vegas, it's pretty much just summer and then not summer. Yeah, exactly. You know? So now, right now, it kind of it almost feels like like we're actually getting a little fall action. You know, uh, the, the, the leaves, for the most part, on the tree behind me aren't really changing that much. But a lot of the trees out here aren't the typical trees that you'll see with a lot of the, the color changes like you do in other parts of the U.S., but no, nah, you got palm man, trees. I, basically, yeah, you got palm trees, palm <laughs> trees, and then this weird whatever this one is behind my house that all the little birds live in. Um, it is so nice, but you're right. I mean, this is this is the best time of the year. Even when we come out of the apex late night after uh, some of the uh, the events, beautiful, it's nice and cool and brisk, and it just feels amazing. Feels amazing. It never gets cold here. I know you would argue with me on that one, uh, but nah. being from the Midwest, I never think it gets. Nah, there's like here. there's like a week or like sometimes in January or something like if the wind is blowing really hard or whatever, it'll be a little chilly. But but that's it. That's yeah, it, that's it. Yeah. Well, and then, even then, it's just like you just layer up a little bit. You put one extra layer on, and then and you're you, good. You know, you, you just know. you still wear your shorts, of course. I mean, that, that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at some point in the year, I start wearing jeans. You stay on shorts, but at some point, I start I start augmenting with the jeans because I. Love, I mean, I love jeans and like pullover, like a nice still t shirt on, and then put a pullover on top of that. So then, when you're you know you're outside and you're feeling good, then you go inside the bar where it's warm and you take the pullover off. You know that's how we do at the bar. I don't even think I own jeans anymore, <laughs> man. If I'm being honest with you, I think I own nothing but shorts at this that's point in my funny. life, and of course the suit pants that I have to wear, and the one and the one suit, the and one the one, the one suit that I have to wear to go to go do CFSC. So, uh, well, that's that's your local Las Vegas weather update. I know everybody you know typically tunes in every week. They say, man, I just love the fact that they provide us weather updates. So that's what you're getting. But I'm telling you, if you're coming out to visit us in Las Vegas, this is the time of year to do so, dude. It's been crazy, yes, man. It's been crazy. Uh, I mentioned. CFFC, CFFC 101 was last weekend, USC Fight Night 193, obviously you were working. Uh, I was watching it in a sports book at the Parks Casino, which was awesome. Uh, I, I told all of our listeners, I, I haven't even told you this, man, I told everybody over at, at Patreon.com uh, the story we had this weekend. Man, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief since it's been a while at this point, and our, our most loyal, respected listeners are already very familiar with this story, but... Um, Man, uh, a good friend of mine uh, at, at CFFC 101, as we went to go watch UFC Fight Night 193 in the sports book there at the Parks Casino, which is really nice. If you're in that area, man, that Parks Casino is nice. But uh, had a four-leg parlay. It was a $250 bet that would have paid $12,500 if it hit. And the, wow. the first three legs hit, and the fourth leg was Dawkins by submission. So it hit. Oh, good lord! It briefly hit for one shining second. We're jumping around the sports book, going, "Dude, that's twelve G's right there, baby!" You know what we're about to that go do? Awesome. Yeah, and uh, and then I'm sitting there watching the whole thing play out. We didn't have volume in the sports book. I think they had volume on like a Penn State football game, but we were watching. I could see what was going on, and obviously, you know, it gets overturned. And so the bet still hit. It just ended up hitting as a three teamer, and it was it was much less because obviously Doc is by sub. I want to say it was like plus. 600 or something like that so that was the the big big odds that was the big one. Oh my god for one brief moment man this dude had a winning ticket for 12-5 in his in his hand that's awesome and, uh, and he's the kind of guy that 
that definitely would have taken us out on that twelve thousand five hundred dollars. So I was like, "Yeah, ooh, what are we about to get into?" But uh, but that didn't happen. So that was a crazy story. Then I don't know if you saw my my Twitter. We didn't really talk about it earlier this week, but when I got home, I went to uh, I went to the to the local gas station over here to pick up a few frosty beverages, and uh, I went to pay for it. And I pulled out my debit card. I had somebody else's debit card in my wallet, dude. I didn't, That's ridiculous. I, I, I went to pay for it twice, and and, the, and it, it got declined twice. And I'm like, no, no, no. I got money in my account, man. It's – He's like, maybe put the PIN number in wrong. So I put the PIN number again. I'm like, no, nah, that's definitely the right PIN number. And I look down, and I think it was actually at the casino. You know, they had taken my card to hold a tab for me or whatever. Mm-hmm. When I paid out, all I saw was I, – I, I guess I just didn't really look at it. It was a red Bank of America debit card, which is what I have. It just wasn't my red Bank of America wow. debit card. So I left with somebody else's debit card. And I'll tell you what's funny is at the, at the, at the airport on the way out, I bought – um, a bottle of water just to take on the plane with me. I definitely mm-hmm. bought that with his debit card. So I apologize, oh, sir. So he bought it. <laughs> so, he bought it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So at least it was your at least it was your same bank because you're right. I mean, uh, a lot of times I'll pull out like a Chase card, and a Chase card is blue, you know, and, and it's got a certain sort of like design off to the side. Like that's the only thing I would ever notice. Mm-hmm. Who looks at the name no. ever? Like whoever double checks something that's in your wallet, you just assume it. I will be doing so, yeah, so from now on. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I should hope so. I mean, what are the odds of that? That's just that's just poor on, I guess, the casino for for not being good on uh, maintaining whoever's card. Because I mean, who checks the card when they give it back to you I, at the end of the night? I mean, how many times have we had to put a card down to open up a tab or you know to just whatever? Who checks it when they give it back? I mean, it's just I you just, look to see, like, oh, that's my color. Okay, yeah, whatever. And I put it back in the wallet. Just throw it in the wallet. But now you will. I, I recommend, now you will. Recommendation for everyone: check and make sure it's the same <laughs> card, or you'll end up in the same situation as me. So that was a that was a pretty uh, pretty crazy weekend. I will say, by the way, if anybody uh, did watch CFSC one hundred and one, if you didn't, uh, go watch it again. It's on Fight Pass, of course. You can catch the replay. It was a good card. Uh, obviously, I enjoy working for Cage Fury Fighting Championships. They always do good cards. I have a lot of fun, <laughs> uh, you know, working with CM Punk there. But I will say, for anybody that was watching it um, and is familiar with the card, I did get a little bit of news. Uh, earlier today that one of our bout results was overturned. So Jonathan Piersma um, basically had a guillotine choke on Chris Vereen. This was two undefeated studs going at it. It was our co-main event. And Vereen's face was was covered up by the guillotine choke, basically. You couldn't see it. And uh, the referee came in and called it a technical submission. It was just 31 seconds into the fight, man. It was just getting started. And Vereen immediately popped up and was like, dude, I wasn't out. I wasn't out. I wasn't out. We watched the replays, and it didn't look to be out, but it was hard to get that, you know, definitive replay because, you know, we didn't have a camera that was, like, you know, positioned in his face or whatever. But um, the Pennsylvania Commission did review that fight, and uh, my understanding per uh, Rob Haydack from CFFC is that they have overturned that result, so it's now a no contest. So uh, if you were watching that and you saw the controversy play out, there's a little bit of update, a little bit of news, and – uh I don't know. Hopefully we'll get a uh, a rematch because it was two studs and a fight that ended um, a little too quickly. So uh, crazy weekend. I know you were uh, stuck working without me in Las Vegas, but I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, th- thank you for, for, for uh, pulling my slack, I guess, so to speak. So uh, I know the CFFC is keeping you busy. I feel like that's a, re- a it's a recurring thing now. I feel like the last few events I haven't had you there. <laughs> I know. Listen, hey, and there's going to be a few more. I'm not going to lie to you. We got a couple more this year. They're, they're, uh, we're going to do. I think the news is going to be announced this week. I think by the end of the year, we're going to do three more MMA cards and two more grappling events. So. Uh, I think they're getting uh, all that announcement will be out shortly. But uh, so we've got five more cards well, by the end some, of the year. I better get some extra pay then if I'm doing double duty. <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you negotiate that, sir. I'll. I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly put in a good word for you with the powers that be over there. Uh, I did make it back, of course, for Contender Series. I think, uh, I, dude. I think this past week's Contender Series is like one of the most exciting that we've uh that we've ever had i mean i know there's always some good fights in there um mm-hmm. but I, I think this past weekend's was was or past weekends past tuesdays was one of the best yeah, like you mean like two days ago <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how it all runs together i'm sitting here thinking it's, it was two days ago <laughs> <laughs> uh it was good though man I, I thought it was a fun one and um Man, yeah, they were good fights. The, 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 good fights. The, the tone was set by Patrick White. How about that first fight, man? He literally just sprinted yeah. over across the cage and just started wailing away. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the ones where, uh, you know, when, and it's funny because I know you asked Dana sort of afterwards, you know, is that, is that kind of what you want? And he's like, uh, no. no. <laughs> but it's like, well, Dana, in the past, that's kind of that's kind of what you've implied. You know, you want somebody to go out there and throw down a bang. And it was awesome. I mean, I know the commentary was really sort of just sort of trashing the technicality of it a little bit. But, you know, honestly, I think that was probably partial half of it was nerves probably and just trying to get loosened up and just trying to get into it but i thought that fight was a lot of fun and it was just you're right it set the tone for the night because it was just at that point it was just action 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 but that's what i kind of expect that for a lot of guys that are going to go out there if you want to make an impression and and either go out on your shield or get a spectacular knockout that's how you're going to do it you know is going out and doing that and um i guarantee Every both the matchmakers and Dana weren't going to forget that fight after how that started, and uh, but yeah, it was great. But that was that was a good night of a good night of fights, and it's funny because it all starts to blur, um, you know, what, to try to rate. I think if luckily that one was so recent, that's why I think we got that recency bias. You definitely bias have, re- you definitely about have what recency is, bias. It's, it's because I, how, how do you remember all forty two events or whatever at one time and and really compare it. them? I feel like there's been other days where we were just like, oh, my God, that was the greatest. And I'm like, I can't remember when that was. But I know we've said that at some point. I feel like we've, you know, talked about some of the guys that night and been like, oh, my gosh, that 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 person's a stud. And then you watch a, 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 the next one and it's outstanding. And then we're like, wait, who was I thinking about the other day? I can't even remember the name, you <laughs> so know. True. And Dana, Dana sent it. I mean, he credits the matchmakers um, for them even last week when it was pretty much all – international fighters Mm -hmm. you know it's just like for them to be able to just start stacking these things out with legit like some of the finest prospects and and professional fighters around the world in these shows and getting them in there um it's been fantastic i mean i love tuesday nights just for the fact of that we could take it easy until the end of the night and then we do a little bit of work and then it's done so we can actually sit and watch the fights um it's fantastic um and i love it because there's no there's no there's not too many bells or whistles. Just literally, let's walk them in and boom, fight. Walk them in, fight over and over and over five times. Some nights six, and then <laughs> uh, and then and then we get to find out immediately. No, I mean it's literally Dane and them. I think they have the pre sort. They must have a sort of idea in their head of who they would hope to give one to. Yeah, they get it done. And then depending quick. on the performance, because they're 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 talking afterwards is almost instantaneous. I mean, we're talking less than five minutes. And Dana's out there talking to to Laura to give the word, you know, and uh, it's awesome, man. I mean, like this this level has been I know we've said it every time is that these contenders are studs. And now, you know, to kind of give people clues on how I do a lot of my staff picks, I look I look back to see where where they came into the UFC. And if they came in on the the contender series, they already get a notch up because yeah. I, we've seen like the level of these cats that go through. And look at the studs that have went through, and now how they're doing in in the uh, the UFC proper. I mean, it's bizarre, man. It's nuts. If people aren't paying attention to to contender series to see who the next up and coming potential star is, they're missing out. That's it. They're finding out after the fact. You know, they're finding out after the, somebody's been on a, a UFC card once or twice and start starching people, and then they're like, "Wait, where did this cat come from?" Yep. They're like, "Oh, well, he made his break on the you know the contender series." Oh, what really? Wow. I'm telling you, they, these these kids and uh, are fucking studs, man, on this show, man. So when Dana says like credit to the matchmakers, you got to give it up. You know, it, it's Dana not just selling the line. Um, he's giving praise where praise is due. I mean, they Sean deserve and Mick it. Sean, Sean do and a Mick, fantastic job. I don't think people realize how stressful that job is, man. And you're talking about it now. You you got to do contender series too, man. I mean, everybody always says like, oh, that'd be the dream job. I'd love to do that. It does sound cool, right? Like I get to pick yep. who fights who. You know, that's awesome. And. It is cool when you think about it like that, but what you don't see is all the stuff behind the scenes of, first of all, just now in the COVID era especially, is just how often fights are falling out and just how much is having to be yep. replaced. That's a pain in the ass. But then you start to get into all the, I don't want to say politics behind the scenes, but, you know, where, like, people aren't really True. taking fights behind the scenes, but they don't want to say that in public, you know what I mean? But behind the scenes, they're they're not yep. getting back to you or they're not, you know what I mean? Like, they're well, I don't want to fight that guy and I don't want to do this. And there's just, there's just so much. It's 
it's a headache, man. It really, it really, really yeah. is. And, and and you're like making and breaking people's hearts. You're making, oh. you're giving them the shot. You're you're giving them that shot, and they're going to be on the top of the world. And you're also the person that says we're not going to renew your contract. Yep. You know, you're also that person. I mean, uh, I'm sure the calls from them are one of the most happiest, incredible days. But also for somebody that's maybe questioning their position, you see that phone come on. You're wondering if you're getting a fight or you're getting your walking papers. Worse. I mean, like, there's a whole lot of stuff of what those guys do that we don't even think about. We think about, you know, like you said, the cards and just getting the cards together and making sure fighters stay active. But also, these are the ones that they have to go out and find time to do the research, to go out and watch these people. But also, behind the scenes, you know, unfortunately for these guys, they are also helping to decide you know, if somebody is still viable to stay within the organization and when is it time to to let somebody go? When is it time to let that contract play out? It used to be almost guaranteed when a, a fighter got to his last fight or had one left, they were usually going to the renegotiation right. table, you know, and almost almost so to the point that fighters just assumed um, that when it got to that last one that they were going to renew for a bigger contract, you know, and now we're seeing it to where we're hearing more and more guys talk in the post-fight presser saying, well, that was the last fight of my contract. I'm hoping to hear from Sean. I'm hoping to hear from Mick. And it's just like, oh, wow, you haven't already? And then you can immediately feel the stress level on them. I feel stress for them. <laughs> and I'm not even I'm not even part of the family. But it's like. So true. You know, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy to, to think. I mean, it, it, it would be a wonderful job to be in because you know that you are controlling. Uh, in a sense, you are making the magic of a fight night when you put the, the, the card together. You can kind of almost control the speed, the tempo of the night by the placement of the fighters sure. that you pick. You know, if you're going to pick two two guys that are going to go out and bang and put them right at the beginning, you know, you know the night's going to start off strong. Or if you know you got a couple of heavyweights, you're like, oh man, where do we play them in the card? You know, so they get to sort of be the maestro of the event and help pick the order of how things are going to go. And I mean, it's it's a, a fantastic thing. I think it would be super exciting to be in that. But I think we'd realize really quickly. That there's a lot of other stuff involved with that job that would make it not so fun to be in that job. That's the case. Know? That's the case. I mean, those those you know Joe Silva before him, and you know those two guys. Oh, they yeah. they love the sport, but it's a uh, it's a stressful position to say the least. So it's kind of nice For to sure. hear them get a little bit of praise. And you're right, letting guys go. You know, they understand what they're doing. They understand that they're terminating somebody's dream, basically. You know what I mean? They're ending yeah. somebody's uh, you know the, where they always wanted, and they don't they don't take that stuff lightly. I know Joe Silva used to talk about the worst, and I I, I feel like you don't see it much as much anymore. But guys that do self manage. Like, that's even worse because at least, you know, when a guy has a manager, you can at least call him and say, hey, listen, man, sorry about your client. We've got to go ahead and, you know, that's going to be the last one for him if you can let him know. But when somebody self-manages, like, you've got to call them directly and be like, "Yeah, sorry, bro, that, that's going to be it. You know, thanks for everything. Uh, take thanks it easy. For, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for everything. Um, we're going to be taking you off the email list. It just heads, well, heads up. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. So All those little things you don't think about. Yeah, man, crazy. All right. Crazy. But listen, but speaking of matchmaking, let's talk about this week's card. UFC Fight 94. <laughs> what? Let me get that. UFC Fight Night 194 is the card that you and I are covering this weekend. Of course, we did Media Day yesterday. Uh, I like the main event a lot. Mackenzie Dern versus Marina Rodriguez. Um, I, I like it because it's a meaningful fight in the division. I don't think it's necessarily a number one contender fight for the strawweight division because you've got – Carla Esparza, uh, you know, kind of sitting there and waiting to see what happens with Rose Nam Yunus and Zhang Wiley. And I think she really deserves the next shot. Although, you know, Mackenzie Dern is um, is thinking that maybe it'd be possible to, to jump the line a little bit. So, um, but it's a meaningful fight. And it very much is kind of old school clash of styles with striker versus grappler. And I love the fact that both women are just kind of admitting like, yeah, that's what, that's what it is. It is striker versus grappler. Yeah. So, uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll, I'm not going to try to strike with her. That's, that would not be smart. I love it. I love the fact they're doing, and I love the fact that it's an early start time, man. How about that? You get, you get MMA so early. early 10 30 in the morning for us here in Las Vegas, one thirty on the East coast. And then the main card starts at uh, 1 PM Pacific, 4 PM Eastern. So even those fans over in Europe, I think they get like a decent, a decent time for this one. So let's do this. Uh, before we talk about the card, let's just hear directly from Mackenzie Dern. Uh, she spoke to me and us uh, obviously you were recording everything about uh you know this fight and kind of what it means and and where where she goes from here and uh you know really is is, is focused on taking some big steps in her career at this point so uh let's let's take a listen to uh, Mackenzie Dern 
Kenzie, you've had, um, uh, you know, a lot of attention on your career from the beginning, it seems like, but a, a UFC main event, I mean, does this feel like a, a, a special moment for you? Yeah, I think all the fighters, when we go into the UFC, we start to sign the posters. We always wish, like, man, I hope one day will be our face on the on the, on the the poster. So, finally, it's my turn. And, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm meant to be here. Hopefully, this is the first of many soon, like, pay-per-view cards and things like that. But, um yeah, we've been training a long time for this, and it's a main event, so I think this is a perfect opportunity for me to kind of see what kind of numbers I bring in uh, for the next negotiation of my contract. Um, and just for who didn't know me, um, to get to know me now, because I think even if you don't too big of a UFC fan, you're going to at least see the main main fight. <laughs> yeah. Look, look at you. You're, you're a businesswoman talking about it. You're not just thinking about competition. You're thinking about numbers and that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the more when I say like I'm focused, you know, I'm really focused on everything. You know, I just changed my um, my manager, so my agency, so now I'm with Paradigm and I'm definitely thinking about the long term, you know, which is totally different than where I was on my UFC debut, just kind of, you know, enjoying the hype and enjoying that fun time. Now I'm really thinking about, okay, uh, maybe go up to the weight class after a, be like a double, double weight champ, you know, and just constantly new goals. And yeah, it's good. It's awesome. You, you've been competing since you were a kid. So, I mean, uh, main event, like headline, does it bring any pressure? I mean, you're talking about all the upside of it, but uh, is there any like nerves or a different feel of it? Uh, no, like the media is the same about really. Uh, I'm always, I always, I've always said, you know, I'm always better under pressure, you know, always since my jiu-jitsu career. Like the regional events, I always fight worse than the big events, you know, so I'm always able to um, – kind of grow to the occasion so i'm definitely i this is what i've been waiting for you know so i'm really really excited about it no doubt career going perfect uh four wins in a row i think three of those bonuses as well so i mean is this just like mom strength or what's you know what's going on here that, that everything is finally really clicking yeah i think it's uh definitely the focus of being a mom you know my i don't need to look for the motivation i think a lot of the hard thing is like for people to kind of look for motivation all the time you even get motivated but it's kind of temporary, temporary. Um, but when you have a daughter at home, you know, it's like even when she's crying or when she's happy, it's just constant motivation all the time. You know, always remember why you're really doing this for. And uh, and then honestly, just to be like connected with Jason Perillo, you know, I think that's kind of a good, good um, match that we made. Uh, everyone's saying like, man, your, your striking has gotten so much better. And I've had like three first round submission so it's not even like they've been seeing a lot of my striking but um the little bit i've shown um they can see the the how it's evolved and just my striking with him is making my submissions come way easier than than before when i'm just trying to hug the person and close the distance and i'm not really knowing what i'm doing now they kind of have to think about my strikes my punches and then the takedown is coming way easier so i think that's why my submissions have come even easier because of how Jason Perlo is not making me a striker, you know, but he's making me uh, a champion, which is he's worked with BJ Penn, who's a jiu-jitsu guy, Bisping, who's a striker, you know, he's worked with all different types of people and he doesn't need to prove anything to anybody, the coach that he is, you know, it's like uh, he just, you know, I think a lot of coaches, maybe that they don't have big names for themselves, they kind of, they want their athlete to win by something that they taught them or something like that and coach is just making me uh, easier to be the best fighter I can be, which is to keep me with my roots, but make me dangerous everywhere. That's awesome. So it's been uh, six months since the last fight. So, I mean, is it just constant striking? What's been the focus in between? Is it, is it just like working on striking every day and don't, don't worry about rolling because you got that? <laughs> Yeah, basically. I mean, of course, uh, you know, I, when my dad comes, he lives in Arizona. I'm in California. So he comes down, stays like from Wednesday to Saturday with me and we'll roll. And just to keep like, um, you know, to be like um, on time, you know, with my with my positions and things like that, not get too far behind with my timing. But uh, just, yeah, I'm with Perillo every single day, basically, you know, so Monday through Friday. Perillo, just my boxing striking, um, and with my dad work my takedowns and things like that. So I'm going against a striker. The the strategy isn't to be standing up there with her. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to try and com compare my striking to her striking. Of course, if I go the whole five rounds striking, I'm ready for that. I'm confident of that. But I think the easiest way to beat her is by the ground. You know, so uh, definitely this fight was. Um, 
plan to get to the ground. And I mean, I think with Virna, for example, who's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, I, ha I was focused a lot on my ground just to make sure my timing is good. And with Marina, I think um, I didn't have to focus so much on my ground technique as much as I wanted to like make sure I keep my hands up because she has a good right hand and things like that. I was going to say, that's what's interesting about this matchup, right? Because both of y'all are working to be complete martial artists, but it's no secret. Your backgrounds are totally different. Yeah. But I'm curious, like, is there any, like, mental part that you have to battle, like, that you want to go out there, like, this bravado, like, ah, oh, I'm going to show the world I can outstrike the striker. You know what I mean? <laughs> is there any part of you that has that inside of you, or is it easy to go, like, let's just get to the ground? Yeah, definitely. Let's just get it to the ground. You know, I think my the beginning of my career in the UFC, you know, that was kind of the time for me to get into these brawls, you know, with, you know, we're all unranked girls, you know, and now it's like, okay, now we can have a mess up, you know, we can't make a mistake because the top five, you know, the champion, one mistake and that's over, you know. So I definitely think that there's a bigger chance that I could knock her out than her to submit me, you know, just because you just need to land one in the right spot, you know, to finish. But I'm not, I'm not going in there like to try and show that I can, um, you know, exchange with a girl who's trained Muay Thai most of her life. You know, I definitely want to show the efficiency and kind of take advantage. You know, I prefer to fight a hundred percent striker than someone like Rose, for example, who's good at striking, has knockouts and has like flying on bars. And she kind of, She's not, she's not like a fish out of water on the ground, you know? So definitely I know I need to work harder. Not that I don't need to work hard for this fight, you know, but um, I definitely think that the cardio for 100% striker is worse on the ground. It's a little bit more panic, you know, a little bit thinking about the takedowns the whole time to not get taken down. So I definitely like this matchup way more and I'm, I want to show the efficiency of my jiu-jitsu in this fight for sure. Nice. And, uh, I mean, uh, you mentioned those top names. I mean, you win here. The, you're, you're right there, right? So, I mean, are you thinking, you know, title shot with this or I, I guess maybe number one contender fight? I don't know if Carla would be the fight. I mean, what do you think you deserve if, if you win impressively here? Yeah, they had kind of offered Carla before Marina. But, I mean, Carla's from five straight wins. She was Dex champion. I think she, um, like, wanted to wait it out to go for the the next in line for the title. So it's a little bit hard because our division, it's kind of like on hold, you know, the champ, they can kind of choose when they want to fight. So um, for me, I'm looking at this fight as a title and fight, you know, I know there's not like the media of a title, but in my mind, this is a title match. I don't see like Marina or Rose. I see this fight being a title fight because I really think that if I go in there and put on this like exceptional performance that I can maybe jump Carla and go straight for the belt. Um, but I'm not in a rush, you know, if I, if I win, but maybe I got hit a couple of times, like with some things that we could get better. I don't mind doing another fight instead of like having to wait for, I don't know, whoever will win Rose or Shang Wei Li when the next time they want to fight, maybe they just want to fight in June of next year. Hopefully they don't get beat up too much, you know, but, um, who knows if they want to fight like in March. I don't, I, my mon my momentum is so good right now. I've been in almost a little bit over a year, five fights. Um, so that's that's what's good for me is just to keep that momentum going. I don't want to take too much time off. Uh, before this fight, I was asking like for Mick and stuff. I wanted to fight earlier. Um, they had offered July, but Marina couldn't in July, just October. So I said, hey, if you have anything before then, I'm ready to go. I didn't want to take too much time off. They offered Carla, but Carla wanted to wait. So who knows? But if I... I'll be five straight wins if I win, and Carla's five straight wins, so I I can definitely see maybe they're putting the pressure on me and Carla to kind of just get that sixth win, and then we go for the title after that. So this 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 fight has is going to tell a lot what's going to happen next. Yeah. Last thing for me, you, you laid it out. I mean, there's a lot of big, important fights ahead of you, but you touched on this two-division thing. So when does when does the, the flyweight run start? <laughs> no, definitely after my um, after I get the belt in the in the strawweight. But yeah, I'm just, I'm working with Rogério Camões. He's making me um, stronger, just feeling good. And it's, I fought at 125 before, but it was kind of like a little bit, um, not a very strong McKenzie. It was kind of like a little bit uh, lazy McKenzie, like not so professional. So definitely just watching Valentina, um, you know, she's a long time at the belt. This kind of like, you know, the girls are trying, we're trying, but I'm trying like, man, we, we need someone to fight her, like maybe a jiu-jitsu girl is the one to beat her, who knows, you know, but definitely I can see myself getting to 125, but as like a fit McKenzie, you know, so I'd really, that, that idea is getting more and more attractive to me to go and, and you know, try and just make history, you know.
All right, so there she is, Mackenzie Dern. Uh, just I, to be honest, man, I like. I, I feel like she's incredibly honest. I feel like she's incredibly open. Um, I know she's going to catch grief for saying that you know she's open to that idea of a champ champ run and and you know that maybe uh, she could be the one to take out Valentina Shevchenko. I know she's going to catch grief. McKenzie McKenzie seems to catch grief for everything. Obviously, she, you know people still harass her about her accent and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm sure she's going to catch some grief, but. To be honest, I like that attitude, man. I like that attitude, and uh, you know, I've, I've always said I don't pick anybody against Valentina Shevchenko at this point. And I know I should point out, as she said, she's staying focused at 115. So I don't want to take away from her run at 115, but you know, she can keep winning if she does become a champion. I kind of like the idea of her facing Shevchenko. At least this would be. I mean, her jujitsu, Mackenzie Dern's jujitsu is off the charts, and at least that would be something that is better than Valentina Shevchenko, right? Because I don't know many people that can say they have better striking. I don't know. I don't, her jiu-jitsu is amazing. Her wrestling. Mackenzie Dern, okay, she'd have her hands full on the feet for sure, but if she could get the fight to the ground, that's kind of an interesting fight, right? Yeah, if, if she was able to get her to go fully all in um, on the ground, I think, of course, Mackenzie's got incredible skills there, but we've never seen anybody do it. Right. Uh, even if you got her down like – Valentina always does a good job, at least keeping it within her world. Um, I think if she ever felt that she was maybe overextending herself and was possibly giving an arm or a leg or anything that uh, Mackenzie could really do something with, I would think that she would pull back right. and, and just take it back to the striking. And as much as Mackenzie is crediting her striking getting better, and it is, and she looks so much more comfortable in there when she's th standing and throwing shots. Um, it's still just a world of difference yeah. between between the two of them. Valentina right now fighting, oh my lord, is... Uh, I mean, I know we say it every time that, that she's the best at what she does. I mean, she looked even better the last time we saw her um she's every time we see her flawless her focus flawless it's just it's just impeccable doesn't make mistakes and that's the thing she she would have to make a mistake to allow herself to get on the ground i think if anything that would do it would be like uh her feeling overconfident that she was so confident in her ground game that she would want to test herself on the ground with mckenzie that maybe that little bit of hubris would be what would be her downfall if if if, if she didn't pull out and soon enough but she's talented enough that when she got on the ground i think she would want to get down there and do some damage some ground and pound and once you take enough elbows on the face you know you might be the best jujitsu person in the world but if you're eating a bunch of shots at some point they're going to stop the fight because you're right. either going to go out or you're going to have to start you know releasing whatever lock that you're trying to do because you got to guard your face i mean her ground and pound has gotten so good um lately that it's just devastating i mean it is just a, a, it's a work of art her effort that she's put in and how i'm mean, not that she was ever like a slouch on the ground but she doesn't look like the same person that we saw like a year two years ago i mean she she's gotten so good and i think that's why people are calling for that trilogy between nunas right now because valentina's fighting at a level better than what she was when she fought amanda the first I time think so too and uh Oh man, what a what a killer fight there would be. And a lot of people were kind of torn on that last one. I mean, Amanda edged out, but there's been some razor thin fights between those two. And if you're talking about that's the level you need to be be to beat Valentina, that's incredible. Because Amanda Noon is at this point, I mean, easy to say. I mean, we consider her the GOAT. Yep. I mean, Cyborg held that mantle for a long time until this woman just ripped it right off the wall and said, I'm taking this mantle home with me. Get off the floor when you can, you know. Uh, it's fantastic. She's fantastic. And and while Mackenzie, I mean, she has her hands full with a good striker here. Yeah. But this striker is nowhere near Valentina. Well, yeah. you Valentina, I mean. You touched on it there, right, is, is the fact that, I, you know, I, I'm, we're sitting here talking about this potential matchup with Shevchenko at some point. We may find out in this week. Now, I, I did pick Mackenzie Dern in this. And I think kind of what Mackenzie yeah. said, what Mackenzie said in that interview uh, makes sense, right? Where she says, "Look, I, I mean, I'll be honest. I, you know, I, I love the fact, first of all, that she just said, yes, 'Yes, I'm not going to sit here and try to strike with her. I don't need to. That's silly. I'm not going to do that. She's better than me at striking.' Uh, but she did say, and I do think it's true, that I do have a better chance of knocking her out than she does of submitting me, right? Because I could land one shot and could hurt her. There's no way she's yep. going to out jujitsu me, and I tend to agree with her there. But to your point exactly, Cole Coffee. I mean, 
Marina, I think Marina Rodriguez is a fantastic striker. She's not Valentina Shevchenko, yeah. but she's good. And while I did pick Mackenzie Dern here, I will say it would not shock me if Marina can just stay away, pop, pop, jab, you know, just throw combinations, yep. move, stick and move, stick and move, because she, she's really good at that, right? Head kick somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, man. I, <laughs> look, I, you know. Obviously, I think McKenzie's going to be dangerous at all times. It's kind of, it's a different fight, obviously, but it kind of, the, the danger reminds me of how we were talking about Ortega and Volkanovski, right? Like, I, I thought Volkanovski was going to yep. win that fight, but I was scared because I was like, look, the thing is, Ortega can end that fight at any minute, and he damn near did with that guillotine choke, obviously. But I think Dern's kind of the same way. Like, she's got the ability as well to be, like, you know, pieced up on the feet for four rounds and then jump on your back in the fifth or grab an arm or grab a leg or whatever the case may be. So I'm picking Mackenzie Dern in this fight. That's my staff pick. Um, but yep. I will say this. I'm not counting uh, Marina out of this fight because, you know, she's good on the feet. And if she if Marina goes in there and does what she does, she could make all this talk about a potential Valentina matchup seem like, what were you guys even, what were you guys even thinking, you what know? What were you even talking about? Yep. So, and you're right. I mean, and when you look and you go look at her record, who's the one person she lost to? Carla Esparza, yep. the woman that we said, okay, this is the person that should be at the top of the list getting the next shot. Um, she's fantastic. You're right. I mean, Mackenzie, while we while her striking has gotten better, and I love that when you when you talk about in the interview and things, she said one of the best things she said as well was like, you know, in the earlier days, I would want to just go out there and try to stand and bang and try to prove herself. But now, I mean, the wisdom of a mo being a mother, the wisdom of having those fights and getting the experience, she understands that it's better to stick with what works for you. You know, keep working on the skills. And she's got the great team behind her. I mean, Prillo's a beast. And if she's saying they're doing that every day, they're working on her striking, her striking's going to grow leaps and bounds every day. I mean, you have a coach like that, and then you're putting that effort. But, man, Marina is a stud as well. I mean, when you, when you take – and even that Carla was a split decision loss. Um, you know, it wasn't like this was like a unanimous, right. you know, swamping or anything like right. that. I mean, I think people, you know, and and Carla's probably got some of the best, if not the best, like one of the best wrestlers and ground control games in the women's MMA. Absolutely. And if she's able to kind of control that and be able to still sort of work her striking – that's going to that's gonna say something for, you know, how this bout's going to go with McKenzie. If McKenzie can even control and start to get her on the ground, that'll be very telling, uh, and that'll kind of tell us where the fight could possibly go. But you're right. If she's able to stay up, stay distant, and work all the different strikes and angles, she's better in that game than uh, than McKenzie yes. is, and she could do some damage. And, and then it, I think it will just depend on the work that McKenzie's been doing to try to negate that striking you know, take a shot, give a shot, and be able to get in there and get a takedown, and, you know, get a hold of her, you know, then that'll be something. But, man, uh, I was, I, was, I as well picked Derm because I, I just see that her level of improving um, seems – it just feels like it's going exponentially. Every time we see her, she seems a lot better than the last time we see her, and I just feel like uh, that momentum is swinging her way, you know, and uh, – who knows? I mean, my my picks have went to shit lately, but I'm kind of <laughs> with you. I'm kind of with you on this one as well. Um, I just felt that the overall um, skill set of being a decent, decent striker, but an incredible grappler, ground game, jujitsu master. Uh, it's just it's more than the than the more of a one dimensional. Not that I want to call sure Hadrick uh, is a one dimensional, but. I just feel like she has more ways to win uh, than her opponent. Yeah, so I, that's why I went with Dern. I dig. I think it's going to be a competitive matchup, so I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, I should say, by the way, if you like what you're listening to, uh, and why wouldn't you? It's fantastic. You, 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 take a second, if you would, please, wherever you're listening to uh, to log in and take a moment to uh, rate us, review us, give some feedback, whatever you can do. That, of course, that helps the algorithm, as people like to say. It does help us get noticed. Uh, you could be like our man uh, here, if you, if, you, if you don't mind listening to or, or, or you listen on Apple Podcasts and you don't mind logging in there. You could be like our man Scott McCrate, who said – if you dig MMA, this is the pod for you. Gave us five stars. I appreciate that, Scott. Whoa. Said, said the MMA Roadshow with John Morgan is the podcast that I listen to pre-fight to get all the breakdowns and predictions for the weekend card. Give this podcast a try, and you will be hooked. Smash that like slash love button and subscribe. He's doing the work for us. Thank you, Scott McCrayton. Obviously, Scott is a stud because he is uh, a hardcore who is uh, taking his game to the next level. If you really want to support the show, 
not only can you do that, not only can you rate us and review us, which we appreciate, but you can head on over to patreon.com slash the MMA Roadshow where you can support the show for as little as $3 a month. Kind of helps us keep the lights on here. And uh, you get access to our special and a half episodes where we wrap up the events each and every week and uh, give you a little a post-fight show for each UFC fight card. And also over there, We'll answer your questions. You got you got special questions. I just answered a question for Scott McCready. It was some behind the scenes stuff. This was some technological stuff. He wasn't even <laughs> he wasn't even asking about fights. He was asking about some broadcast technology. But I jumped right on that and got that answer for him because man, you support us. We're gonna support you. We're cool like that over there. So we uh, that's it. And I will tell you when 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 we're doing our live streams for Junkie, you know whose names I recognize first during the stream and I want to chat with on the, on the chat. It's our Patreon people. Damn straight. It, it, it bleeds over to MMA Junkie as well. We, we play, it does. Hey, you know it what? Does. We play favorites. I'm just saying right now. We <laughs> play favorites. Hey, if Mark Fellows drops a, a, a comment in there, his comment's getting read. That's just, it's just that easy. Yep. It, you, 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 yep. you support the show. We play favorites. So I'm just going to throw that out there. That's it. So we appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> listen, I'm not going to do a, a detailed breakdown on the rest of this card. I, I think we'll just be honest. I mean, in, in terms of – Overall depth, this isn't the deepest effort that the UFC has, has laid out there. But I, I think some interesting matchups, you know, Randy Brown uh, versus Jared Gooden, that could be absolute fireworks. You know, Gooden had some uh, difficult matchups early in his UFC career, uh, but had a big win last time out. And feel, it really feels like he's kind of coming into his own. Randy Brown, honestly, you know, longer path than Jared Gooden, but similar. You know, he came to the UFC very early. And, uh, you know, it's had some ups and downs, but he feels like he's really, uh, you know, coming into his own as well right now. He's 4-1 and one in his last five. That only loss uh, to Vicente Luque, by the way, who was right up there at the top of the division. So Randy Brown, uh, I went with Randy Brown in that fight, um, but I think that one could be excitement. Ditto for Tim Elliott and Mateus Nicolau. Uh, that could be a, a barn burner of a flyweight matchup, so I'm intrigued by that one. I did lean Nicolau in this one, uh, but Elliott is always a, you know, a, 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 a threat to anyone in the division just with the way he fights. Uh, Maria Agapova and Sabina Mazo could be fireworks as well, so I think we're going to have some entertainment. Agapova, of course, has been out for a long time. Uh, you know, She was kind of healing from surgery. Uh, she had that loss to, to Shayna Dobson that everybody was really shocked about. You know, She looked like she was going to be the next big thing. Um, but now she's kind of back, and she says, look, I've changed everything. I've moved camps. I've changed my approach. I'm doing things in a more professional manner now. I'm excited. Sabina Maso, same thing. You know, she was the head kick queen. Um, and she's, she's had a setback, but now she's kind of reinvented herself as well. Both of those are very exciting women's fighters, so that could be a lot of fun. And then uh, the main card kicks off with Phil Hawes versus Deron Wynn, um, which I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Obviously, you and I have been longtime supporters of Phil Hawes, man. This guy has been the next big thing for a long time. He's finally started. Starting to deliver on that 3-0 in the UFC now, um, facing Deron Wynn, who's you know a, 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 a you know a, a fantastic wrestler, got that short little compact body, so it's kind of a unique uh, body type that you got to face with. And I will say, I thought it was kind of funny that Deron Wynn was like, "Yeah, man, I'm I'm excited about this matchup. I've known I've known Phil Hawes forever, you know, on the wrestling scene. Uh, we you know way back to, to when I was a teenager, I followed his career as a wrestler. Uh, I'm excited about this." And then we asked Phil Hawes, like, "So, man, Deron knows you from the wrestling scene. Do you you you? I guess you must know him too." And he was like. Nah, nah, I've, I've no, I have had no idea who he was. I was like, oh, well, that's uncomfortable. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, I think the, you know, but you know, that's gonna that's gonna that's gonna fire Duran up though. Oh yeah, to hear that he's like, oh, oh, okay, oh, okay. Yeah, you you, you act like you don't know. Oh him. yeah, he pulls that. I can imagine, I can imagine like wrestlers because I, I know at least in Ohio, which had great state wrestling and other stuff. People on the scene, they know whether whether or not they maybe want to admit or not. If they're on that level. They know who they are. You think, so, you think Phil's kind of gaming them a little bit? Um, he could be. I mean, because if I want to say DC knew of this guy's sure. wrestling oh, yeah. back in the day. Yeah, yeah. If DC knows, I guarantee Phil probably knew, but maybe was like, ah, eh, you know, I ain't gonna give him, I ain't gonna give him no shine during my <laughs> interview. You know, but but maybe maybe you never know. There's there's always a possibility. Some people have very uh, tunnel vision. They focus on themselves and they focus on their immediate teammates. And they don't really look around uh, to to see the whole field. But we also know others, you know, that watch a lot of film on, you know, in the MMA world that watch a lot of film. They watch the division. They study everybody that's in the game. Some people don't. Some people are, are very focused. So Phil might legit be one of those guys that never really paid attention to anybody that he didn't immediately, you know, wrestle or, um, you know, have ties to. So maybe, but... I don't know. My guts tell me that might be a little game and shit. Like he just doesn't want to. He doesn't want to give him any shine. I like it. Yeah. Because if 
you know, you, you never know. You could bet if Deron wins, you're going to be getting one of those. You know me now. You know my name now. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, how good would that be? Uh, Remember my name, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think the main cards could be good. I will say, uh, you know, I don't know if there's anything on the main card you want to touch on, but I will say on the prelims, um, the one name that I've really got circled on the prelims. Although I will say Damon Jackson, Charles Rosa should be a lot of fun. I've always been a big Damon Jackson fan. He's been on the show before. He's a good dude. Um, and I think that's going to be an exciting fight. Um, I will say uh, Alexander Romanoff is the name that I've got circled on the prelims is, is one that, um, that that I'm really looking forward to and that I think you know could be a legitimate contender at some point down the division. He's, he's, he's a great grappler. He's undefeated at this point. Um, you know, I, I, That's the one I'm looking at. So anything on the card that's, that's standing out to you most for the weekend? I mean, I think you all you pretty much laid it out. I mean, I know, anytime Tim Elliott fights, I'm excited to see that, and I think uh, you know. So I'm excited about that because both him and his opponent uh, are incredible fighters. So I'm looking forward to that one. You know, uh, just because Tim Tim's like one of these cats, man. I just I love seeing him, and I but I feel like you know, not that his days are numbered because I hate when I say I say stuff like that, but you know, he's had a good reemergence and stuff. But there's just something about his fight style and his honest and openness like through the week that I absolutely love mm -hmm. seeing him. Um, you said it, Charles Rosa, Damon Jackson. This is one of those ones, man. Damon's takes some, some losses. I mean, um, I like Damon. Damon's another old school dude, but man, this is not a great fight for him. I mean, at least matchup wise, this is a very, very tough fight. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm kind of excited to see um, if he's able to answer those questions. Cause Charles has a lot of, he is a strong, good puncher. Um, Damon's taken some, some hard losses, um, recently. And it's just, I don't know. Uh, I just feel like if this doesn't go his way, this might be one of the last times we see him mm -hmm. in the UFC. Um, so I think there's just some, you know, I don't know. I, I there's, and I think we're going to see more of those as, as these cars go, you know, with the, in, with the contenders coming, the contenders is bringing more people on. I think some of these cars with these lower I don't want to call them fillers. That that sounds disrespectful. But some of these people that are filling out the sure, the, the, prelims, the prelims, filling yep. out some of these cards. You know, uh, some of these times, I think they, these are like the fights where they're like, are they still able to stay at this level kind of deal? And I feel like this is that fight for Damon. If he can get the win, let's keep him around. Let, let's keep doing these things. And I and I say that with love because I love Fortis. I love the guys down there. But Damon, man, he's had. Uh, it's been tough, man. Uh, he has these moments of, like, great, 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 great. You know, LFA, he was just storming through dudes. Things look great. They bring him back over to the UFC, gets that win over Bechtick, and then he comes up against Tapuria, and it just was – it was a bad loss. It was a bad loss. Yeah. And a couple fights that were supposed to happen didn't happen. I don't know. Uh, I just – so I'm, I guess I'm interested in this one because I have questions to see, um, you know, how Damon – how he still fits because uh, – I like the dude. I mean, he's always been cool to us. He's always been great with Junkie. He's Absolutely. done whatever. Um, so I want him to do well. But, man, this is a really, really tough fight. I, I kind of almost wish they would have gave him um, something that maybe wasn't. In terms of record, it looks they look very similar where it's, you know, win-loss, win-loss sort of deal. But I don't know. You know, one has – well, I guess they're both – now I'm looking at it. Rose is 35 as well. It's not like he's a, a spring chicken either. Definitely. But, you know – these are, he's actually older than Damon. That's crazy. There's, just, I but mean, I feel look, like these guys. There's just no easy fights in the UFC. You know what I mean? Like, there really isn't. Charles is a tough dude that's been around and proven himself. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, 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 there's, there's stakes in that one, and, uh, and, and I'm intrigued in just a stylistic matchup as well. So, I think that's going to be a good one. So, uh, we'll of course yeah. have full coverage of that at MMA Junkie. So, tune in uh, over there to get uh, full fight coverage, and then of course, patreoncom slash the MMA Roadshow for and a half. We'll wrap it up afterwards. So, uh, again, not the, not the deepest card, but, listen, it's uh, I think it's going to be fun. I think I, I do see some stylistic, entertaining matchups. It's early in the day, too, which I like. Uh, you know, if you're if you're not like us, you don't have to work afterwards. You know, you can watch the fights and then go have your <laughs> go have a go have a Saturday evening. You know, go do something. So, uh, listen. By the way, also it'll be the first of uh, back to back weekends with uh, with the uh, women's headliners for UFC events. Of course, uh, we got to change. I was just up. thinking about that. I, I mean, I love the fact that they're getting they're giving the women some shine, man. Yep. This card. I mean, it's got what one, two, three, three women's fights. Uh, they're all decent ones. I mean, like it's awesome to give them back back. But it makes it makes a point. One of the funny things that we heard in the uh, the presser, um, looking at the poster, who was it? Was it Randy that was like, dude, I co-main event? Yeah, I thought I was Randy finally going to get on a poster. 
But when you guys look at the picture, if you guys haven't seen the poster, has Dern and Rodriguez up top, but then on the bottom has it like an action shot, like they're squaring off, ready to strike. So in the spot where normally the co-main <laughs> would go, they they doubled up on the main event and just left it with Mackenzie Dern and Rodriguez. And so he was like, "Dude, I thought I was going to get on the car on the on the poster." That was funny, and he didn't get it. You know, so I thought that was great. But you're right. I mean, I love the fact that. Uh, they're giving the the women the shine. Um, they deserve it. You know, more often than not, um, they don't get these opportunities unless some of these big big names. And as these girls are rising up in their in their, uh, you know, superstardom, you know, so it's kind of cool that they're giving um, a couple that aren't. I mean, they're they're prospects. I mean, they're contenders. They're giving them the shine, you know. And then we're going to get to see another one, you know, the the following week. So that's really. It's pretty cool, man. It is cool. It's, in in terms of what they're doing for promoting women's uh, MMA, it is cool. It's awesome. There's no, I don't. I, awesome. I don't think there's another sport on the planet where the women and the men are, are are promoted, you know, equally. To be honest with you, so I mean, it's it's uh, it's cool to see, man. I've always thought that was a great thing about the UFC once they actually finally added women, of course. And, and of course, next week I'm going to be interested to see what the reaction is because Aspen Ladd steps <laughs> in. Uh, she faces Holly Holm. Now, Aspen Ladd's another one that I like Aspen a lot, man. I really do. She, you yeah, talk about she's somebody super sweet, super, super sweet. sweet, and it's always been great <laughs> to us personally. Always been great to MMA Junkie as well. But you know, she is going to be getting some absolute hate next week during fight week because she just missed weight. I'm sure Macy Chasson isn't too happy about the development that we're seeing here, right? She misses weight. Yeah. The fight is off, and she's rewarded with a main event in her next fight. Um, I will say this, you know, I. Clearly, if, if you watched uh, Spinning Back Click this past week, you know, the weekly show that we do where we talk about things, I said right away, Aspen, move up to 145, right? I mean, y- you think about it. First of all, what, we, what we've what seen from her on the scales on multiple times is scary. It's not healthy, and it's a little bit scary. Yeah. And so I don't want to see that. For yeah. that reason, move up, okay? But the other reason was this. This is such a unique scenario in the fact that the goal is literally exactly the same at 145 and 135. Beat An- Amanda Nunes to become a UFC yep. champion. So why are you killing yourself to go to 35 when you could literally do the exact same thing at 145? I mean, no, nobody is going to say, oh, well, you beat Amanda Nunes at 145, so that doesn't really count. Like, no, it counts, yeah. and that belt <laughs> will be around your waist, and you're the one that beat the GOAT. So I, I love this move. I applaud this move. I'm so happy for the move. I think this is the right move. I hope she stays at 145. I hope she doesn't win and go, well, that was great, but I'm going back to 35. No, I hope she stays here yeah. um, because I think she could get a title shot at 45 pretty quickly, assuming you know she wins. But I will say this. I know, and I think she knows too, she's going to catch some grief next week uh, for people that are saying, how the hell do you miss weight and then get a main event You know, two weeks later? It's true. We – I was saying it just myself, not too, <laughs> not too long ago. I wasn't gonna, you know, I wasn't uh, gonna tell on you, but since you told on yourself, man, I don't man. care. <laughs> I don't care. You know, it is it is a little something, but I mean, it goes to show what they how they uh, what they feel about Aspen. You know, obviously mm. they recognize that she is a talent. Um, she's fun to watch, but you're absolutely right. I mean, whether you beat Nunez at 35 or whether you beat her at 45, it's the exact same Nunez, you know? Um, and I think it's great, but I, I can see in her mentality, if anything else, if she tests the water, does decent, if anything, I can see where she's going to want to try to still be able to do the bantamweight. If she could somehow augment her fights and move and, and, and sort of take fights in both ways and somehow have a, a contender sort of spot in both divisions, I could see where in her mind she's like, Hey, you know, I'm going to fight twice as much, you know, and if she can do it, but you're right. I mean, this cut obviously to 35 is devastating for her. Um, seeing the shake, I thought we were going to see her fall off the, uh, the scale a couple times, you know, and they kept her standing and waiting and all this other stuff. And that was, you know, to a point where I was, I was so mad that at some point just make the decision to bring out the digital scale. If somebody's struggling and they're, they're struggling with the scale and they think there, there, there could be you know, some sort of something taking place, whether, you know, somebody's trying to cheat the system or not, just take that old rickety ass mechanism out of the way and put the digital scale. She was standing up there for so long and struggling. I'm like, man, if they could just put on a scale, nobody has to touch it. Nobody has to manipulate anything. They could just make sure she's not tugging on the sides of the things or whatever and just get the reading. You know, they, they should work something out where they could just pull something. But I know that... The current system, you know, they have one in the back that's been, you know, certified. And so they 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 
sort of test the two between the two to make sure that they're sort of you know operating at the right. same level. But you could do the same thing with digital. Agreed. Scans. I just feel it was so hard. It was it was so much tougher what they were putting her through while she was struggling. That took like fifteen minutes to get through that whole thing. When you have a, a, a fighter needing hydration, struggling to stand, that can't even hold both hands up in the air without almost what looked like convulsing. Like you got to do something to take that and alleviate that situation. So, I mean, I don't know if that's just something we can, you know, in just comments could talk to the the commission, like, is this something that you guys would consider or is there something that you could do, you know, to alleviate that? I mean, why stick with the old analog systems if you know that every time you have to manipulate it and there's there's little things that can break down if you know the digital is just going to give you what it is can you just opt to that can you can you just call an audible at some point it's, and just say hey we're going to bring out the the digital it, it's you know, it's such something. a weird thing because you're absolutely right like I, I know a lot of people prefer the beam scale because you can kind of you can kind of nudge it a little bit and maybe get away with a little bit more. But, I mean, if we're talking right. about accuracy, the digital scale is going to be accurate. You know what I mean? And I, I, I don't yep. – I just – I don't know, man. I think some people find the, the you know, the, the analog system, as you said, to be more reliable. But it, if anybody's ever been on one of those, I mean, I you know, I wasn't in the room. You were. I was watching the stream. But, uh, you know, those those – the, the top of those things, they move a little bit. I mean, that's how it works, right? And it yep. started moving back and forth, and she's, like, shaking. And, yeah, man, it was uh, it was hard for me to watch, and I was just watching a damn stream, dude. You were sitting there in the room. Yeah, so. I mean, because you'll Ugh. see it sometimes, like, when they'll call the number, the, the, the bar will drop down, touch the bottom, and then as it's going up to the top, okay, there's our weight. Slide the yeah. weight off. You're, there's play. There's, Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely that, reasons why they want to do it. That there's no play yeah, in the digital. You just get and it's it, gonna, it's gonna, and it's instantaneous. There's it's, your number. It's instant. There's your number. Yeah, and it's instant, right? You're not, you're not waiting as as we were. Where it's just step on and like you said, there's the number. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, you're not talking about a, a you know, a, a twelve dollar target scale. I mean, I'm sure there's some. It'd have to be a really, really nice digital scale, but. Um, Come on, man! It's out there. Like, why don't why don't why don't I mean, change? And it's been done before. They've used them. I mean, they've used them. They've used them. They've certified them. They've done they've done the things at least working into a process when it's like, if a fighter's struggling and there's a risk that the fighter could fall while trying to use this other scale while we're trying to do it, what can we do to ensure? Because it should be a fighter safety thing. If you want to stick with the, the 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 old scale, that's fine. But call an audible at some point when. When there is a fear that a fighter is going to fall, injure themselves because you're trying to finesse the system, they should be able to step and, away and go to a digital. And they definitely one, thought you know, she was, even if even if it doesn't mean. Oh my God! It was it was it was frightening. The guy, one of the commission people, got right behind yep. and like he was ready to catch her. Yep. I'm like, this is not good, folks. Like it it went on so long that I felt bad for her. I, I really really felt bad and and some people might harp and say, "Well, she put it on herself. She should have cut more weight beforehand, blah blah blah." Regardless of that, that was the situation that presented itself and that's where we were at and it was prolonged and it made it even worse. Yep. So as it went on when she was trying to stand, she'd been struggling to stand for the past 10 minutes and then here we are, five more minutes going at it again and you think that she's not going to be shaky more shaky than what she was when she started of course it was just oh man it was it was just scary but i'm glad that uh, <laughs> we're not going to see that fingers crossed we're not going to see that <laughs> in this coming week because she's going to have that whole extra 10 pounds to kind of take it but I'm, this is not a i mean that's a tough cut and then immediately weeks later oh, you, you do it dude, again can you I, listen I, i'm gonna go ahead and knock on some wood and hope that it doesn't happen can you imagine if for some reason she misses weight or is struggling to make feather weight i mean at that point at that point i'm sorry at that point people are probably just gonna say you should just hang it up because what, what, what they are you will doing? literally try to they will verbally burn her at the stake yes, they if, will. if she comes in heavy at that they will there will be no um they w- no mercy. It would not be. No mercy. Not be gentle. No <laughs> mercy at all. It would be. It would be absolutely brutal. Um, but man, that is a tough one, man. What do you do? I mean, do you, I guess you try to recover from that weight cut that you just did. Yep. But you can't fully go back to what you need to kind of get your body right. You almost have to sort of stay sort of depleted to a degree. I mean, I'm not sure what so she normally walks around at. That's it. I mean, like she's, now she's got to maintain a, a sort of weight cut through this whole time I'm, I'm sure she can't be too much over 
45 normally i don't know i i can't well, i'm nope. not a good judge of of women's body sizes like how much because she packs on muscle hey, muscle weighs more we saw so, i mean i don't know we saw the uh, california state athletic commission weighed her on fight night and she weighed 159 pounds that's wow. that's fight night so i mean i imagine she's basically staying like in camp but i imagine if she's that on fight night then i would think normally she's probably maybe a little heavier than that so maybe like 165 or something than that. than that you know somewhere around there so so she's got to stay within a like like a cut for the next like two weeks. Yeah, I mean she's not not as drastic as she will fight night, but she's gonna have to be reducing her calorie intake and and vitamins and nutrients and all these things that she needs. Oh man, that's gotta be man. T- oh boy, that's terrible. I hope I hope, <laughs> I hope the PI is involved in helping her out and giving her uh, expert advice. So uh, we'll see. She should just be staying at the PI yeah. at this point. Yeah, <laughs> just pull up a little cot over <laughs> in the corner over there. Just, <laughs> just pull the cot. Oh, uh, man. Well, that'll certainly be a focus of next week. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, listen, she she doesn't speak lengthy. You know, I mean, she's she's all, she's always happy. She talks she talks very short sentences and very direct and very quickly. Uh, I'm sure she's not going to yeah. love talking about everything that happened, but uh, obviously we're going to have to. So stay tuned for that next week. All right, let's, let's do this. Uh, before you and I uh, got together to, to record, I had a chance to speak earlier today to Vicente Luque, uh, top welterweight Ooh. contender who's uh, looking to book some uh, big fights before the end of the year. He's got some names in mind, so uh, he's got some other things going on as well. So uh, I figured I'd bring that audio in here. We'll debut it on the MMA Roadshow. You'll see it on MMA Junkie later. But if you listen to the podcast, you already know. You already have it. So uh, let's turn now to Vicente Luque. Uh, all right, Vicente Luque, always a pleasure to catch up with you for joining us from Brazil. So thank you for that. Uh, just get into it, man. I mean, two months since that big, impressive win over Marco Piazza. What's uh what's been going on in the meantime? Are you enjoying a little time away, staying in the gym? What's what's going on? Yeah, uh, you know, I enjoyed a little bit of my time. I rested for about two weeks, but then got right back to training. Uh, it's hard for me to be too long away from training. I, I enjoy, you know, I have fun in every single session. And especially I want to fight one more time this year. I think that I have it in me. I had no injuries in my last fight. I'm training really good every single fight. I feel like I'm evolving. So I want to still fight one more, hopefully December. That's awesome, man. We'll get into that. I did want to ask you, though, uh, I noticed you got your black belt in the meantime, right? I mean, uh, listen, I know you're chasing after world championships and all that, but uh, black belt's a pretty special moment, right? What, what did that mean to you? Yeah, it was really special because I got two black belts in the same day. Uh, I got my Luta Livre black belt and my jiu-jitsu black belt so that was pretty awesome and i've been training jiu-jitsu since i'm 16 years old i'm 29 now so that's a long time and luta livre i believe i started at 20 so also a long time and yeah for me it was an honor i think that uh i've been showing you you know i'm evolving on, on my ground game my grappling that's also one of my strong tools my my weapons i don't show it all the time but my last two fights, I showed that, you know, I can really hang with the best in the floor. That's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. Two black belts. That's even more impressive, <laughs> man. And I got to ask you, you came to Las Vegas also for USC 266. I wanted to ask you what that experience was like because, you know, we haven't had fans in a long time, right? So to be able to hang out with the fans, take pictures, sign autographs. And, and also, I got to think your popularity has to be higher than it ever has. I mean, did you get that feeling that, that people are really starting to – to know who you are and to support you in, in, in your journey. Yeah, I definitely felt that, you know, the, the fans support was really big this time and it was great to be with them, you know, to spend time. It's nice to be able to hang out with them without having a fight, without, you know, thinking of, of my camp and whatever I got to do, just go out there, have fun, be a fan also, you know, and, and enjoy the fights. So it was a, a great experience. Got a lot of uh, good energy, good positive vibes of all the fans, and you know they like my style, so I try to give them uh, the big, the best show I can, and then I always get their retribution back. You know, they're 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 always thanking me for that, and yeah, the fights were great, also. You know, uh, especially that last one, Ortega with Volkanovski. It was a crazy fight. I mean, I was standing up all the time. I couldn't believe uh, Volkanovski got out of two submissions. Yeah, that was unbelievable. Yeah, it was a great night for sure. All right, so let's talk about your career, right? You you touched on it, you know, waiting to get a fight. You beat Michael Chiesa. Michael Chiesa's got a fight. What's what's going on here? Did, did you see that? Did that kind of offend you a little bit? Say, wait, I just beat this guy. Why is he fighting? 
I mean, it's, you know, so I was talking to, to my coach about that today. Uh, when we started our my career and I just got into the UFC, I thought like, okay, now I got to take every single fight. You know, there's not much that I can do. I cannot choose when I'm going to fight, who I'm going to fight. But I, w I thought in my mind, maybe when I'm up there, top five, top ten, I can pick and choose a little bit better, have a little bit more timing. But it's not what's ha going on, you know. I still am here, stuck. I, I have no fight. So, I don't know. It's just, uh, I think that it's hard, you know. With my style, sometimes it's hard to get a fight, you know. People, uh, I am number four right now. I know that there are maybe guys ranked lower that want to fight me. But I'm looking to fight guys that are going to propel me to that title fight. And those guys that can propel me, sometimes it's, it's hard to get them to fight, you know. Because my style is dangerous. I know that they... Uh, if they study me, they'll see it's not going to be an easy fight. Win or lose, it's not going to be a, an easy fight for anyone if they fight me. And I think that kind of makes it challenging. But at the same time, uh, I don't know. I, I have a big opportunity with Nate Diaz. He wants that fight. I want that fight. So, you know, I think I think that I couldn't ask for nothing better. Uh, to have a guy like Diaz wanting to fight me is, is awesome. All right, so that's what I wanted to ask you about for sure, right? Because he he retweets your quote. You know, he says, let's do it then. Let's go. Uh, what's the word, man? Like you said, you straight said, I think it'd be an amazing fight. You know, no disrespect. I just think it'd be a great fight. And he says, let's do it. To me, that's that's done. USA, Sean yeah. Shelby, Mick Maynard, Dana White, job done. Just send <laughs> the contracts out. So what's going on? I mean, when two guys want to fight, you know, you got to make them fight. What else, what else can you do about it? But... Uh, I think that the UFC, you know, they got to figure some things out. I talked to my manager, Ali, and I let him know that I really want this fight. You know, I'll, I'll be ready in November, December. Whenever they want to make it, I'm going to be ready. And we're trying to make it happen. I mean, I know Nate wants it as well. He's looking forward to fighting in December. So I think it, it makes sense. Whenever he wants to have it, I'm going to be in. Uh, I'm going to stay ready. And if, if it makes sense for the UFC, I think it does because, you know, it's it's a big fight. I might not be, you know, that trash talker, but I can fight. I can go in there and put on a show. So, guys, the fans are going to want to watch this fight whenever uh, I'm matched with somebody. They are going to watch it and match with a guy like Diaz. I think that's that's even better. So, yeah, I think it makes sense. I think the UFC can make this happen, and we'll see. Uh, I'm ready for him or for any other guy. You know, there's Leon Edwards. We don't know what's going on. Masvidal is on, on that. Maybe he's going to, you know... Masvidal is waiting on Leon. I don't know if that's going to happen. There is me. There is Gilbert also. So maybe he'll fight Gilbert. And we'll see what's going to go on. I'm going to stay ready. It, in my mind, the perfect card in December would be me and Nate Diaz and then Masvidal and, and Gilbert Burns. That would be on the same night. That would be awesome. Look, you're booking the whole division. You're not just booking yourself. You're booking everybody, man. Making the, 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 the matchmaker is always stressed out. You're making their job easy. So let, let me ask, do you – do you get the impression that the holdup is that they're waiting to see what happens in November with, with Usman and Covington before they make any moves? Is that kind of the feeling that you're getting? Yeah, I believe so. I think that's something that, you know, it's it's going to be a big difference. If Kamaru keeps on with the, with the title, it's going to be one thing. Now, if Kobe takes that, it's going to be a whole different thing. A whole different fights are going to happen. So we got to see how it's going to play out. Uh, in my mind, I think Kamara is going to win. You know, I, I would put him as a favorite for that fight, but we never know. We got to watch it. So, yeah, maybe that's what's going on with the UFC. I'm going to stay ready. Right now, I'm training like if I were going to fight in December because if things play out the way I want to and they end up matching me, you know, with, with Nate Diaz and they only let me know in November, I'm going to, you know, get a head start right now and, and start training camp right now. Well, I mean, if you're training for a 10-round fight, you need some time to do that, right? Yeah, man. Uh, you know, that's that's something. Uh, I'm actually willing to do it. I'll do it. You know how many rounds they want to go. Uh, I just have fun fighting. I've always had fun fighting. And my, usually I don't fight that long just because of my style. I'm able to finish it before. But whenever I fight three rounders, I have so much fun. Those are the fights that I, I most enjoy. My fight with Barbarina, for me, that's my favorite fight. I always talk to my coaches, and they're like, man, how can you like that? You know, how can you enjoy being in a war like that? But I don't know. I have fun. I have fun on, on, on tough fights. You know, it's like they it takes out the best of me, and I like to be challenged. So, yeah, if, if we can go 10 rounds, I would have fun for sure. You're a madman. You're a mad. Listen, I, I'd love to see it. I think you and Nate would be a great fight. But let me ask you a question because you said it. 
you, you like Usman to keep his belt. Now, if he wins the title, do you feel like maybe you are the most deserving to jump in there with a, with, with a title shot? Because, you know, Leon Edwards is there and he's been waiting and he certainly has a great win streak. And obviously he does, you know, you guys do have history. It's just several years back. But, I mean, do you feel like he has the inside track? Or if, if Usman wins, do you think maybe you should be the one to get the title shot? I think both of us, you know, both of us, we can make a case for that fight. Uh, obviously, Leon has the 10 win streak. Uh, he beat me in 2017. But he already fought Kamaru, and he got beat by Kamaru as well. So that's something, you know, uh, I think people want to see fresh blood against Kamaru, and that's what I am. You know, I'm a guy that is up and coming. I'm finishing most of my fights. You know, if, if not all of my fights, I, I only haven't got one finish in the UFC out of my wins. So uh, everybody knows that I'm a challenge to Kamaru. And, and at this point, I think that's what they want to see, somebody new that can go out there and, and really challenge the champion. So if Kamaru keeps the title, I think that I will be the perfect matchup. Not saying that Leon doesn't deserve it. I do think he does des uh, deserve it because of his win streak. But, you know, he's he has the opportunity to secure that by fighting Masvidal. And he chooses not to. That's also tough, you know. I'm a guy, I'm always active. So I think my activity can be rewarded in, in this situation. Nice. Is it the fight with Leon, is that one you want to get back at some point? Definitely. Man, I, I would love to fight him right now. You know, if December he would be available to fight, I would fight him. I mean, I think it's a fight where uh, in 2017, it was a tough fight. You know, I, I think I had the first round, then he beat me on the, uh, two, uh, the second and third. And I know that I can get that one back. You know, it was close. I had the first round. I, I made some, you know, bad decisions during the fight. Not taking anything away from him, he beat me fair and square. And after that, he went on an unbelievable run. But I know that I'm a different fighter right now, so I definitely believe that I can beat Leon. No doubt. Well, listen, there's a lot of big fights on the table. Hey, I did want to ask you one outside of your career. Uh, I'm curious, uh, Tyron Woodley, did you watch him box? I mean, obviously, you were his last fight in the UFC, and then he went on to to have this boxing match with Jake Paul. Did you did you watch that whole thing play out? And, and if if so, what did, what did you think about it? Yeah, I watched it. Uh, I wasn't happy because, you know, I didn't want Jake Paul to win. But, at, you know, it's hard to judge boxing. In my mind, I had uh, Woodley winning that fight just because of, you know, aggression and the way he, he made uh, Jake Paul walk back. But that's more of, of a MMA standpoint. You know, in MMA, we try to put, control the octagon, put pressure and really, you know, pressure their opponent. And usually that gives us the round. But in boxing, sometimes it's different. We've seen in Mayweather, he moves back all the time and he still wins all the rounds. So, I mean, it's it was tough. I, I gave it to Woodley, but it was a close fight. And I don't know. I, I, I did believe that Woodley was going to knock him out. And I, I know that he has the power to. Uh, for, for one point there, for one moment, I thought, man, he's going to knock him out right now. And it didn't happen. So, yeah, it was a crazy fight. Uh, I, I didn't like the outcome. I wish Woodley had, had beaten him. But I don't know. Maybe we'll see that rematch. And if it happens, I think Woodley is going to be way more aggressive and, and, and make sure that he doesn't, you know, get a, a bad decision and goes out there and finishes the fight. That was my thing. If he'd have fought the way he fought you, if he'd have fought that fight like that, I think he clearly would have won the fight. I was hoping we'd see that guy. So I was the same as you. I was, you know, not that I'm cheering against anybody, but I still I wanted to see our guy win. I wanted to see the MMA guy win, you know. Yeah. And I think if he'd have fought like he fought you, he would have won. Yeah, I think I think we needed a little bit more aggression. You know, he had it on him. I think he ended the fight. He looked really like not not gassed at all. He was out there, you know, with a lot of energy, a lot of power. And he looked great in great shape. So, you know, I think that, I don't know, sometimes we get stuck on some things when we get into a fight and we don't do what we thought we were going to do. And then after uh, we want to change things. So that that's tough. You know, we got to go out there and, and just uh, do what we got to do. And I believe that he could have knocked Jake Paul out, but he did it. Maybe if they have a rematch, that, that will happen. No doubt. Well, listen, we'll focus on you. Uh, November November six, I think, is a big night. So, so what do you do? Do you you just you, you keep training like you're in camp, and then you hope you get an answer? Then, I mean, you're wanting to fight before the end of the year. Is there like a like a deadline that you have to know by when you know you're going to fight, and then at some point you just stop for a while, or what, what's the play? We just wait till you know USC two sixty eight, and then we and then we hope that all the answers are known at that point. 
Yeah, I think that right now that's that's my plan. I'm I'm gonna keep on training as if I were gonna fight in December, and after Kamaru and Kobe uh, fight, I believe we're gonna get a lot a lot of answers after that. You know, maybe maybe there is a slight opportunity I get that title fight, or or you know I I get the Nate Diaz fight. We'll see what's gonna go on, but in my mind, I feel like for me to be a hundred percent, you know, secure the title fight one more win would be ideal that's why i have my mindset on december uh, i want to fight one of these top guys you know leon masvidal and nate nate would be the the ideal fight for me you know because of his history because of you know uh he has a lot he brings a lot you know and also his style i enjoy his style i think his style is a perfect matchup for me and i'm a perfect matchup for him and he wants that fight so you know it's it's not a, uh, it's not a no brainer, you know, just go and make this fight happen. I think it's, it's, there is no doubt in my mind that it was going to be a great one. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to think of this. I'm going to keep on training and hope that December I get a fight. I love it, man. I think it's a great fight. Look, you got, once you're done fighting, man, you got matchmaking, you know, Sean Shelby, Mick Maynard, Vicente <laughs> Luque, UFC matchmakers. They got it all done, man. For sure. No, I, I would love to do that, man. I, I love watching fights and especially I love imagining how different fights will go on you know i think that uh styles make fight and and when you match two good guys uh me and nate is like fight of the year potential you know it's it's a fight that a lot of people especially like my style a lot of people thought that my fight with kiesa would be a boring one and i knew like i i don't have boring fights there's no way that's gonna happen because i'm gonna make it exciting in some kind of way i don't know how it's gonna happen but it's gonna happen and at the end of the night, it was a great fight. So, you know, it's it's just my style. When I get in there, I, I bring the action, and I, I'm going to entertain. Awesome, man. Well, glad to hear you're training, staying ready. And like you said, I think after UFC 268, we're going to get a lot of answers. And the good news is, no matter what your next fight is, it's going to be a big one. There's no question about it. I mean, we're talking about the very top of the division. So uh, we'll have something to look forward to, hopefully, by the end of the year. We know it'll be a big one. So uh, best of luck, Vicente. I appreciate it. Congrats on the black belts. And uh, we look forward to it. We'll wait till 268, I guess. Then we look forward to hearing the fight news. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. And let's go. Hopefully, December, I'll be in action again. All right. Well, can't can't get a much nicer guy than that, Vicente Luque. Uh, in a unique position, right? I mean, uh, you know. It kind of has to wait right now. I think I think that's what we're doing. We're just waiting on USC 268 to shake out in New York, and then I think we'll have a more clear understanding of all the matchups that make sense at welterweight. So unfortunately, I think we got to wait for a little while. But I love the fact that he's just staying busy anyway. You know, keeping training that way. You know, even if it, we have to wait till then to find out what's happening, at least he can take a fight right after. I love that. Um, and and honestly, you know, if it's not a title shot, and it, I don't think he'd get a title shot. I mean, I, I think there is a case to be made there, but probably not. But, uh, you know, look, a, a fight that Nate Diaz is saying he's willing to take, do it, right? Because Nate, Nate sometimes will disappear yeah. for a while, you know what I mean? Take advantage of what yep. you can. So uh, I say put him and, and Nate Diaz together. Uh, and, and, and last thing I want to share with this, um, I, this is a little behind-the-scenes info. The USC did offer him a fight, I was told. They actually offered him to fight Gilbert Burns. Those dudes are like best friends, man. They've been, they've clearly said a million times like we are not fighting each other. But the the USC offer that, and I thought that was kind of interesting because I guess it's not the USC's job to necessarily read the headlines or care if you're saying you don't want to fight your friend or whatever. But I don't want to say that's like disrespectful, but it just seemed weird. Like I don't know if they, I guess basically they were just offering him a fight to say, well, we at least did offer you one fight, but. Um, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of bizarre that the USC would even come to the table yeah. with that fight. I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, we've seen it before where guys are like, you know, the only way I'll fight a friend is if it's for a title. And, you know, uh, I'm sure the USC does remember every time that's even said, you know, so for them to try to keep track. But when you look at the rank, UFC rankings, I mean, number four, yeah, number two. I know. There's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of breathing room of other guys I up know. there, you know. I know. You figure they got to just at, at some point – do their due diligence to at least ask so they could say, okay, well, we, we tried. We did our so job. when others say, well, why aren't, why aren't you making number two fight number four? That doesn't make any sense. Well, we tried. If they didn't and just said, oh, well, you know, we were going to offer it, but then we remembered that, oh, hey, they're buddies, and they said that they didn't want to fight each other. Right. Um, how many other guys at some point have 
said like this is my absolute my boy we train we 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 bleed we sweat together but we both understand that we have something that we're both striving for and due to a title opportunity that's 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 one thing that i'll do that's one thing that we'll do and we'll be friends afterwards i mean it happens over and over and over it's refreshing to see people um say that they're not going to do it and then actually stick to it right i mean like that's legit that's so it's super cool i get it um but man if, if that's the only thing left before you possibly getting to fulfill your dreams there's a lot of questions in the discussion that i think you should have over drinks with your boy <laughs> and decide, hey, can we can we do this well it's, i mean can we actually obviously can we, can you know you and i this? you and i have had that conversation a lot right where it's like look i mean we, luckily luckily the belt isn't there for you a know, title we, we, we both said we would throw down <laughs> He said we would throw down if the title was on the line. Um, but yeah, I mean that's it's crazy. But look at look, I mean look over at Bellator. Look what just happened in Bellator. You know, I mean, granted, blood and family is one thing, but you know, to see a Bellator champ uh, give up his belt so that his brother could go for it. Yeah. Um, this is almost this is almost in the same lines where you know it's like at some point you realize. If I want them to have a possibility to, to uh, fulfill their dreams, you know, am I in the way? I'm certainly not going to fight them for it. You know, I'd rather, you know, step away and let my boy or let my brother have his have his shot. You know, it's a classy move. Uh, it's a classy move. It is. It really, it really, really is. I, it's funny. I joked. I was like, man, he must still be reeling from that AJ knockout. You know, <laughs> and he's like, guys, I just don't even want to fight right now. I just don't even fight. Just take this thing. Let my bro fight for it. Uh, but no, I mean so seriously. That's a. I thought that was a, a wonderful gesture and a, a wonderful example of um, what makes what's important, you know, out there. And family is always a very, very important thing. And if you actually are lucky enough to work in a field with one of your loved ones, or your you know, a brother, sister, or anything, and you have a way to help um, them achieve their their goals or their dreams, you know, something that you've been able to kind of recognize your own um, dream in that process. That's wonderful. I mean, that's that's uh, that's what you want to see. You want to see more. That's more of like humanity, you know. Yeah. Doing what you what you think should happen yeah. out there, and the same with friends not wanting to fight friends. You know, if they realize, you know, um, the the bonds that that have been formed aren't easy to just shuck off for money. You know, like there's some things that, and if that and if they decide to just stick with that and say it's not the the belt's not worth fighting my friend and the the emotions and the feelings that are involved with it, there's something honorable in that, you know? I mean, if they're, if they're happy enough with that going home and, and saying that and, and agreeing to that decision, you know, there, that should be respected, you know? So mm. good on them. And heartwarming, uh, heartwarming, you know, heartwarming. That's the word. I, I, was like, <laughs> I was feeling very hallmark. I was like, where's the hallmark music coming in off to the side? Uh, <laughs> oh man. Listen, uh, I, I, I do. <sighs> Not the greatest transition era, but something that's not so heartwarming that I did want to mention, though, um, and I think it, it, it's, it certainly has to be discussed, is um, the death that we had in, in, in Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. We try to keep this thing a lighthearted, fun, entertaining, you know, have a, a frosty beverage and uh, hang with your boys. Um, but uh, when somebody passes, I think you have to, you know, mention it for, for sure. And, uh, of course, we're talking about Justin Thornton. He, he had an August uh, bout with Dylan Kleckler in Mississippi, uh, fell into a coma, uh, eventually uh, passed away this past week due to to, to the uh, you know the, the damage sustained there. I, I guess the things that I want yeah, to complications from pneumonia or something like that. Exactly. So listen, I mean, first of all, you know, remember Justin Thornton. I mean, this this anytime somebody passes away in combat sports, man, dies. It's it's uh, incredibly unfortunate, incredibly tragic. It's an it's an incredibly realistic possibility though unfortunately it is it is a stark reminder of, of what these athletes do to get in there for our entertainment and yes they're being financially compensated for it and yes it's their decision to do so so I'm not you know saying that they don't take some responsibility in that but it's just a reminder of what they are doing and what can potentially happen um, so that's one reason I always say you know have a little bit of respect for these fighters you know even if you don't necessarily like them even if you you know think they're not necessarily good at what they do uh, you know at least respect what they're doing in there because um, it is no joke to say that they are literally putting their lives on the line when, when they get in there. Um, I do want to say that um, you know I, I, if you've uh, you know we've I've done several interviews with David Feldman, who is the president of BKFC. Um, I I I have confirmed that he doesn't want to say much about it right now, and I think understandably so. I'm sure there's going to be some lawsuits and some legal action that has to be 
uh, handled before he can really talk about anything. So I have reached out to him, and I think we will speak at some point, but I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of answers from him about the situation right now. Um, but I will say, it, you know, it has kind of um, tempered my enthusiasm a little bit for the for the for the moment in, in talking up about BKFC stuff. And I don't think the sport is any necessarily more inherently dangerous than other combat sports. So I, I'm not ready to say, hey, BKFC shouldn't be happening. It's too crazy. I, I don't think that's the case. But I will say this, and, and I think that this is the one lesson that I want people to take out of this because if somebody dies and there's no changes made or there's no lessons learned or nothing is done, then that's, that is truly tragic, you know what I mean? And that's unacceptable. The promotion holds responsibility here. There's no question about it. They put together a fight between uh, a 6-18 and 18 fighter in MMA who had, who had had five straight losses and had 11 total losses by knockout against another fighter who in MMA was 11-1 and one with 10 knockouts. It doesn't take a That's genius ridiculous. on paper to look at that and say – this is incredibly one-sided matchmaking, okay? Now, I know that's MMA, and this is, you know, bare-knuckle boxing, but come on, man. That's a pretty solid indicator of where their skill levels are. Not to mention just, you know, you've got somebody who's had 11 total knockout losses against a guy that has, you know, 10 out of 11 career wins by knockout. I mean, it's not hard to see what you're setting up here. So the promotion takes responsibility in setting up that matchup, but the commission takes responsibility too. And, you know, the commission in Mississippi needs to be held accountable here and they need to understand their responsibility in this because you signed off on that matchup that it was okay. You have to sign off on every individual matchup. And I know that that's difficult sometimes. Now, if this had been a situation where, you know, one guy was 2-1 and one in MMA and the other guy was 1-2 and two and the same thing happens, I could understand how you could say, well, I didn't, I, I didn't realize it was going to be that much of a matchup, but the numbers I laid out for you are right there, and they're not hard to get. It's not like this is some, you know, I, I logged into some secret underground website to find this information or whatever. It's, it's readily available to the public. Um, so... I, you know, I, I don't think BKFC gets off scot-free here. They don't. They made this fight, and they take some responsibility in what happened here. But the commission needs to be held responsible and needs to take some responsibility for what happened here. And, and, and I, I can only hope that this will be a big reminder to not only Mississippi, but every commission in the country to make sure you're paying attention to these matches when they're made and, and, and when you're signing off on fights that you really do feel comfortable with the level of, of competition and, and the matchmaking there because this is what can happen. And, and listen, it, you know, there were some freak occurrences here. A lot of the damage that was done was the way he fell and the, the way the head yeah. struck the canvas. So, you know, yep. maybe it was unpreventable. Maybe it could have been any two fighters had they fallen in the same way. But when there's these red flags – Pay attention to them, and that's I, I guess yep. that's the main thing that I hope people take out of this. Yep, I agree. You know, unfortunately, a lot of those times in commissions, you know, the only time that you get to speak in some of these commissions is when you can make public comment, but you can never get them to ask for it. Um, if you live in that area, feel free. Say your thoughts to them. Mm -hmm. They need to hear this sort of things. I mean, I would encourage anybody that's in that area, you know, attend one of those meetings when it comes to public comment. Tell them they should be ashamed of themselves. You know, you're right. I mean, it's one thing, like, you, the way he fell could happen in MMA. It could happen in kickboxing. It can happen in, in other sports. The, the devastating fall and the way that it, it, you know, affected his spine and things ultimately led to, you know, him having to go to the hospital and where, you know, he was able to he contracted pneumonia while on the ventilator, which tends to happen a lot when you're on ventilators. And things of that sort. But, you know, I've seen people say, you know, oh, man, maybe if they the referees did more like what the, the Muay Thai uh, refs do, the Thai refs, where they dive down, they try to hold the fighter, they try to break the fighter's fall. I would love it if refs do that. I mean, honestly, I've thought about that even in, like, say if you ever have to get in a bar fight, you know, and you hate this person that's coming up to talk shit. And you get a good shot and you see him going down. It's in your best interest to try to help that guy land in the best possible manner. That's how people die in bar fights is they fall back, they hit their head on the ground, and it does more devastation than your punch. You might think your punch is Hollywood style and you want to get a walk off, but this is the kind of thing that can happen. I mean, there's devastating things that happen when they actually make contact. And so everybody's been bringing up these videos of these Thai refs right. doing these acrobatic skills to brace the fighter and support the neck, support the head as they're going down. I would love to see more of that, you know, take place 
in MMA, if they could, if they could make that a part of the training or do something, I, I, I would think that would be leaps and bounds better. But going back to the commission, and like you said, they, they signed off on this and shame on them. Um, I, I get it. You know, sometimes uh, during the day things can slip and maybe you don't look at the the records of the fighters as well. You kind of just take the promoter on his word that, that this is a decent piece of matchmaking. But ultimately you still you still signed off on it. Yep. And like we said before with some of these commissions signing off on the elder statesmen uh, getting in there and throwing down at at, 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 at advanced ages – and while the while those guys are in better shape than me or you, they still shouldn't be going in there and fighting, you know. Right. And these commissions need to be held accountable. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of chances to make that happen. But um, we can at least make them hear it, you know. So if there's a chance, and you guys ever feel it, maybe this is something I should do more. But I know I I, I don't want to talk myself into a corner and piss off a commission and <laughs> get blacklisted from being able to work an event. But uh Say your piece, you know, if that's the only thing you can do is say your piece in a public comment. Um, I think those are good forums to kind of let these people know that we're paying attention to what they're doing and and that, that they should be ashamed and some of the stuff that they're signing off on. Yeah, it's it's a weird position. I've, t- I've talked about this before, but, you know, I've, I've struggled with that over the years with the Nevada State Commission because obviously, you know, I've been, been, in, yeah. been in Las Vegas since 2008. Um, and there's there's a lot of times where I feel like, there's some comments that could be made that would be valuable in that public comment, but I feel like as a journalist, that's not really my place to be there. You know what I mean? It's my, my job is to observe and to report, not to necessarily help right. help make the news or to help be part of the the storyline. You know, we, that's it. At that point, you're you're becoming part of the storyline and you're detracting away from what it is. Um, same thing like when they tell us in politics, they tell us to stay away from it. Don't don't take sides. Try to be as impartial. And if we start going out there commenting these things and saying, "Man, you guys are absolute assholes," <laughs> I don't uh, think I was, I was never going to say that. that <laughs> well, I know, but you know, but on you know, well, that was an extreme. But you know, it, at that point, it's hard. It's hard to to, to try to maintain that you are uh, unbiased in looking at the 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 the, the situation because honestly, we're, we're supposed to gather facts. You're supposed to gather the, as much about the truths and dive deeper into things and the thinking and. But to keep your opinion out of it, and it's hard to, uh, you know, anytime you make a public comment, you're 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 imparting your opinion on it, and that's not what that's what we're not supposed to do. Yeah. But for the public, for the public, go for get it. Get on in there. It's public <laughs> comment. You could do that. So, uh, listen. Uh, well, like I said, I mean, uh, it's an important topic. Uh, I don't want to bring the podcast down, but uh, I think it's one that definitely needs to be it's talked sad. about. Uh, yeah, real quick, let me just say, uh, all elite wrestling. Joe from H Town is going to love hearing this. They're out there trying to make me a fan, man. I, I haven't watched wrestling since I was nine years old, but they got my man CM Punk. They brought in Minoru Suzuki, who uh, I was a huge Pancras fan back in the day, so I thought Minoru Suzuki was one of the the coolest dudes on the roster, man. He was, uh, you know, and now they got him. He's he's a little long in the tooth at this point, but he's still Minoru Suzuki. And now, yeah. now. You got Junior Dos Santos that's going to be wrestling next week. I mean, I'm not going to lie. All elite wrestling is doing everything they can to make John Morgan a wrestling fan. I I, I feel like I feel like I'm gonna have to start getting Punk in here to, to to give us some some AEW wrestling updates or something, <laughs> man. I it's crazy. I mean the the when I've seen when I saw the episode of where they sort of had the whole beat down where the whole team was in there with Dan Lambert, it just felt like it's the natural progression of of some of these guys. Um, you know, is Junior ever gonna be a champ again in the UFC? No, unfortunately, no. no, he's not, you know, but if there is a way for him to, to, to have his career keep going for it, I'd love junior. You love junior. Oh, his Junior's personality's great. Incredible. Man. And if, if there's a way for him to uh, use that physicality and that size and his personality to make money doing stuff like this, I think it's all in great fun. And uh, I, f- I figured it was probably coming the way that that had been going. I knew there was going to be some sort of crossover. Right. And honestly, any of the fighters involved, if there's a way they can make the same money or more money, better money, this is still a very physical. Sure. Physical oh no, it's still an athletic endeavor. It's still an athletic they, they endeavor. They are still getting. They're still getting after it, but um, there's a lot less danger and a lot less bad intention when do, you're doing this as opposed to going in there and really trying to fight. So, if that door opens up for any of them involved or any fighter. There's no shame in doing no, that at all. Not at all. I mean, not at all. And who knows, man? I might. Wonderful. I might have to start watching now, man. I'm telling you, they got the crew in there. I tape it. I tape. They, I, I DVR it. There's sometimes I don't. I don't go back and watch them because they're long. They're usually sure. just like a two-hour episode and stuff. But uh, 
I do find I'll put on the background noise, but then I find like I end up starting to watch, and then I'm like, okay, wait, you're supposed to be background noise. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, they're they're doing it uh, uh, as good or better than anybody else right now. I love the New Japan stuff, um, but I mean, like these these cats are doing they're doing great, man. Um, I don't ever really watch any of the uh, WWE and any of that sort of stuff. I just like what the AEW is doing better than some of the other ones. But I still every once in a while. But you're right. It's like it's like going back to being a kid again. Um, even though I loved the characters that we had as a kid. Oh, I um, did. Yeah, I loved wrestlers. it. I mean, like they were fantastic. But um, the ones now, I mean, they're they're in much better shape than the ones were when we were kids. But uh, they're they're much more fine tuned athletes now. Whereas back then it was personality and there was still a lot of finesse and a lot of athleticism, but you know, what a junkyard, I mean like a junkyard dog, which I absolutely love, but he wasn't the fittest of dudes. Right. You, know, you look at the guys now that are wrestling, they're absolute specimens. I mean, it, they're un, it's unreal. You got guys that could be playing NFL football, that sort of size with that fitness and that finesse, but they're deciding to go out there and, and do professional wrestling. And you're like, fuck, you know, it's, it's just a whole different level of, of, entertainer that is doing this stuff so um yeah it's good but you know i would be surprised if i ever call you up and you're like oh bro hold on i can't talk right now i'm watching the latest <laughs> aew I, hey, I don't i don't see that happening just, but you know you just, maybe you just wait man i got plans for the uh the, the all elite wrestling road show with john morgan man it's uh we got yeah. we got big things in the works <laughs> i haven't i haven't i haven't rolled out the presentation to you yet but in our next our next staff meeting uh i was planning the next on, staff in the next the next corporate meeting yeah i plan on presenting uh, that to 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 you and and the, and the and the rest of the board of the directors for the road show of course <laughs> Has Eli ever watched it with you? No, 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 he hasn't. He hasn't. I bet if you watch it, that would be actually fun. That that might be kind of fun to bring that because you would find yourself if he got hooked into it, then you would definitely watch it more. But um, it would be interesting to see what he thinks about it. Actually, having trained and starting that stuff young and getting to be around fighters, it'd be interesting to see what he thought about it. Because um, obviously, he's a smart kid. He understands, yep. you know, the the entertainment value and you know what's real and what's not but he's also can understand the the uh the physicality and what these people are doing man it's fantastic it's uh it's incredible entertainment i mean it really really is but uh i i like to take it in bits and pieces i you know i i can't find myself watching it every week but when i do turn it on it it always there's always a you know one of the matches will just blow me away um the shit that they do is just mind boggling like literally one move away from paralyzing themselves the some of the crazy shit that they do and i'm like they gotta be fucking nuts man they all have to be oh, a bit course. crazy yeah, to yeah, do yeah. what they do i think so i mean dudes jumping off the top ring onto like metal bars you know where they've laid dudes out and they're suplexing they're breaking tables they're doing shit that's crazy it's uh it's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. I think I think but, <laughs> I think I'm going to tune in for Junior Dos Santos. You know, I've I've, I've tuned in uh, for Punk and, and, and his return, and now I think I'm going to have to have to tune in for Junior Dos Santos. So I just want to say, shout out to All Elite Wrestling, man. They're, they're I, I see you, and they're trying to make me a fan over there, man. I, I respect the hustle. So, uh, all right, listen. I got to pack up because I got to head out. Uh, I'm going to head over to the uh, to the Strat tonight, the UFC Comedy Jam uh, that's being taped for UFC Fight Pass, I believe. So uh, you guys will get to see that later. But I'm going to go catch that out firsthand. I'm actually going to meet our good buddy, uh, Hot T, Oscar Willis, is going to be over there. But uh, Hot T. Chael Sonnen, Henry Cejudo, Dean Thomas, uh, all doing some stand-up over there at the Strat. Adam Hunter uh, hosting. So uh, that will be on Fight Pass uh, at some point. But I'm going to go take a look at it live. So, uh, yeah, i got to run. Uh, this has been fun. And a half this weekend. Patreon.com slash MMA Roadshow. Tune in MMA Junkie. All that. We'll have full coverage. In the meantime, thanks for listening. <laughs>